Well, welcome, everybody, to another segment of Lewis at Large. Yours truly, Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck. And, of course, as always, uh, some 700-plus times, we have uh, doing some smart talk radio right here. And we are very, very pleased this segment to have a wonderful author, Homer Hickman, here. If you do not remember, let me refresh your memory. He had a little thing called Rocket Boys many years ago, number one New York Times best-selling uh, novel indeed ultimately uh, made a movie called October Sky which many of you remember fondly brand new novel called Carrying Albert Home the somewhat true story of a man his wife and her alligator Homer Hickman how are you my friend hey uh, Warner I'm great and uh, I hope you're doing good out there in Kansas one of my favorite states incredible place I, I've been out there a bunch of times I got a friend that uh, actually a crop duster out there a classmate at Virginia Tech is that uh, right? A uh, big shout out uh, to him. So uh, it it is a great state. Well, uh, very pleased to have you here. I'm I'm very curious as to my. From what I understand, this is novel number two. Is that correct? Well, uh, actually, uh, there's been like sixteen in between. But um, well, why are but they? This, pl- it, but this this one um, has gotten it's gotten so much interest it's like okay no you wrote rocket boys and then you wrote carrying albert home that's okay i don't mind if they forget everything in between it's all good <laughs> but uh, since i wrote rocket boys i've had um uh i've written in all these other other different genres like uh, military history yeah. historical fiction and so on and those are good you know they've been mid-list uh, books but carrying albert home looks like that's going to be as big as rocket boy so it's fine um, that you kind of miss those in between. Well, what, now you can catch up. Well, you know what? I'll tell you. I, I, here's what I know. This is the only the only one that I was ever contacted about. So there we go. Well, that's the fault of my publicist, who's now going to get whipped uh, um, after this. No, they're they're no, actually I'm just kidding. They are Peter's a good person to work with. Trust me. But anyway, hey, I do have a question for you. What yes, uh, you're originally from the state of West Virginia. What got you interested in writing? Well, when I was in third grade, I wrote a short story, and my teacher said, well, someday, Sonny, as they called me back then, you're going to make your living as a writer. And I thought, well, you know, I could use the money now. Uh, So uh, I started writing uh, then and actually had a little newspaper and sold it around. uh, around, And um, I got my First Amendment rights taken away from me when I wrote this kind of funny story about my mom, Elsie Hickam. (laughs) And uh, so, uh, but uh, when I was over in Vietnam, uh, by then I had an engineering degree, but uh, when I was over there and wasn't sure I was going to make it back, I thought to myself, what do I really, really, really want to do in life? And it turned out that I really, really wanted to be a writer. And so I had my day job as an engineer, but during that whole time I was writing. And actually there was a a book before uh, Rocket Boys called Torpedo Junction, which was a military history bestseller that has now been optioned for a major motion picture. So, you know, that came out in 89, still in print. So it's pretty much you know, you never know what's going to happen in this crazy old world. Boy, you're going to be a busy person. I can see that right now. What yeah, about... they hired me to write, to help write the screenplay on Torpedo Junction, and uh, so that should, that's always interesting working with uh, Hollywood. Uh, I often say, if you ask an author about uh, about the book uh, made into a movie, it's like asking a dead cow how he liked the slaughterhouse. <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, so it's an interesting it's an inter- interesting journey, uh, shall we say. What about, uh, you said you were an engineer. What kind of engineering did you do? Oh, all kinds of engineering. Um, I, I, I worked for the Army Missile Command, later NASA, and all over the place. Um, but uh, And I was also a scuba instructor. I, I taught uh, uh, the astronauts how to scuba dive and all that kind of stuff. And while, you know, in the background, I was working on my, my writing career. I've had a lot of interest in life. I'm an avid, avid amateur paleontologist, found two T-Rexes so far. Wrote a book that you need to find, Warner. It's called The Dinosaur Hunter, uh, about all that. Uh, but, um, I mean, I've had an interesting life. It's been a good one, I must say. What about, uh, what does is, what is writing do? Uh, does it allow you freedom, or do you become a slave to it? And what creates, in so far, what drives you forward and creates the inspiration? You can't really stop in the middle of a book, or can you? Well, 
Well, you can. Uh, Rocket Boy, that was 250 pages in it, and I threw out every page and started all over again. Uh, I was just really learning how to be a, a writer at that point. Uh, yeah, I mean, writing gives you a lot of freedom. When I wake up every morning, you know, I, I think to myself, oh, boy, I get to go write all day. And, and, and then my wife kind of, you know, she's the long-suffering wife. There's always a long-suffering wife uh, uh, or girlfriend or lover involved when, uh, when, you're, uh, when you're a writer. But it's something that I, I dearly love to do. And in terms of inspiration, I mean, for this book, Carrying Albert Home, it, it actually came out of that movie, October Sky, because I thought that my parents were horribly misrepresented in that. Uh, the father was this dour, stern, mean old man, and the mother was um, uh, something of a wimp. And, in fact, uh, my father was a quiet intellectual type who was a coal miner, yeah. And uh, But my mother was... Uh, was a uh well, she was a feminist before her time she was a woman with uh, vast ambitions and she was stuck in this little coal town which she absolutely hated uh, but over a period of many many years she and my father trying to defend herself himself told me the story about when they uh, carried Albert home, this little alligator that uh, actually was a gift to her from her former boyfriend down in Florida who later turned out to be Buddy Epson the big Hollywood actor wow who was almost in The Wizard of Oz, was yeah, he Yeah, yeah, he was going to be the Tin Man, and he was allergic to um, to aluminum paint. I, I've since met um, his daughter, Kiki, who's a singer, and, um, you know, I, I told her we, we could have been brother and sister if my mom had had her way with, uh, with Buddy. <laughs> uh, but Buddy uh, went off to Hollywood. Elsie, uh, my mom, thought that Buddy was going to marry her, and... Uh, Instead, he went off to Hollywood, didn't write, and she went back to the coal fields and ended up marrying uh, Homer Sr., my dad. And uh, Buddy sent her as a wedding gift this baby alligator with a note that the, all, she only saw two words in that note, love, Buddy. And so I think Buddy Epson was, uh, I know, was uh, Elsie's love of her life, her entire life. Uh, yet um, she and my father stayed together for 60 years, even though they never agreed about anything. And I think it was, I know, it was because they had this crazy, wonderful adventure uh, when, uh, when they carried Albert home from West Virginia to Florida. Wow. If you just joined us, here's truly Warner Lewis from the Flight Deck of Lewis at Large Radio. Got a special guest, Homer Hickman, also known as Homer H. Hickman, Jr., uh, best-selling uh, and award-winning author, as you know, uh, from Rocket Boys, which became October Sky for the big screen, and now a brand-new work called Carrying Albert Home. Homer, when you write, uh, it, this, is it fair to call this historical fiction? What is this exactly? When you blend sort of reality and novel together, what, 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 do, you, what do you call it? You know, my editor asked me the same thing. <laughs> so uh, I said this was a family legend, and I wanted it to be called fiction because that's the well-lit part of the uh, of the bookstore. Uh, if you call it a memoir or, or 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 any kind of nonfiction, then it's stuck away somewhere where nobody can find it. So uh, let's call it fiction. It's a fan. I hope I'm starting a whole new genre here. Essentially, this is this story is all true except for the parts that are not, and they're true too. So it's like all family legends. When you tell the the stories about uh, you know Uncle Frank and Aunt Sue and you know they did this thing, you know you know how it is out in Kansas. You guys tell the stories about your family also, just like we did in West Virginia. Ultimately, there's a kernel of truth in all these crazy stories, and so I'm going to start this whole new genre, family legends, and uh, and maybe uh, hopefully that'll also end up in the well lit part of the of the bookstore. What about uh, as, as you were writing this story, it, you had to make all kinds of choices in how you describe mother, father, friends, family, et cetera, et cetera. Was it easy or did you just go off what you knew and you just sort of wrote it down the way it really was? Well, you know, anytime I write anything that has to do with my family, um, I like to say I get a million dollars worth of psychotherapy that I didn't know I needed until I started <laughs> writing about it. One day, uh, my wife came up in the loft, uh, and I was kind of holding my head, and, and she said, well, what's wrong, honey? You know, And I said, I just wrote about my parents having sex. And, uh, oh, you know, oh. <laughs> that can be kind of difficult. Oh. Uh, but they were 23 years old, long before my brother and I were born. And they were young, wild spirits and free spirits, especially with my mom. So, you know, this, this book is not for kids by any means. It's an adult book. It's, it's, it's for people who are in love or ever been in love or would like to be in love or maybe especially lost in love. 
Um, Carrying Albert home is really written for them. Lots of laughs, but there's this serious undercurrent about uh, when two married people aren't sure they belong together. Uh, well, maybe they just need to put an alligator in the back seat of the car and light out for Florida. What? Uh, let's do this. Let's just give them. You've kind of hinted around the edges here just a little bit, but give us the premise of the book. We're, again, we're not going to put any spoilers out there, but just in general, the theme here and, and the plot is what. The plot is, uh, the theme is, that um, that this couple, this married couple, Homer and Elsie, Homer adores Elsie, and Elsie just doesn't want to be in the marriage. And by um, telling him that he's got to carry this alligator home to Florida, what she hopes is that once she gets to Florida, she's not coming back to the coal fields. Maybe she can convince Homer to stay down there, but she doesn't care. She's going... She's getting out of the coal fields, and she's going to Florida. But she thinks, and he thinks, it's going to be an easy trip. It's going to be a two-week trip. It turns out to be many, many months long where they get into all kinds of trouble, where uh, Homer and Albert accidentally rob a bank, and, and they meet uh, John Steinbeck along the way. Um, Elsie temporarily becomes a communist, uh, leading a strike against this textile mill, and then they end up down in South Carolina, where uh, Homer and Albert end up in the Coast Guard, and Elsie runs the boarding house because they've lost all their money, and then they, they end up in a Tarzan movie with Albert playing a crocodile. And they, uh, they also, uh, we you will read at the end, um, uh, and this would fall into definitely into the area of um, history or historical fiction, where Homer and Elsie get caught up in this gigantic true hurricane in 1935 called Hemingway's Hurricane. They actually meet uh, um, Ernest Hemingway down in Key West, and they get caught up in this horrendous hurricane that took so many lives down there. So there is, uh, through in and out of this book, uh, there is definitely historical context, what it was like to live through the Great Depression in, in, the, in the South, and then all of these uh, crazy events happened to them along the way. And ultimately, well, they find love, and um, that's, that's where we're headed on this whole thing. I've got, uh, on a personal note, my parents were both from the South and also, like yours, uh, came through the Depression uh, in when they're ad- late adolescent years. I'm curious as to, what do you think, as you look back, what were the determining factors you think that made up ultimately their, that contributed to their psyche more, their environment in the South uh, or the Depression? Well, um, for one thing, in the South, uh, everybody's a storyteller down there. So, uh, uh, so I think telling stories uh, uh, kind of kind of buck you up, especially if you're telling stories about your family, and uh, that gives you some some sense of who you are and who your family is, even going through very very rough times. I think there's no question, however, that. Uh, that people who lived through the depression, they really, no matter where they were, they never really got over that. You know, that's why they're always saying, save your money, go to school, do all these kind of things that sometimes we were like, well, you know, uh, why are you hanging on to every last dollar? It's because they saw their last dollar uh, from their parents usually go out the door and then they got hungry. So they understood all that. So it, it very, the depression very definitely shaped these people. And so when I write about Homer and Elsie uh, carrying Albert home, it's, it's set in those times which were really really tough crazy times that uh but still they managed to have a little fun along the way what uh again you've seen a lot of things change in your business uh over the last several decades what uh it sounds almost kind of pedestrian now to ask but why not what how has the internet and social media and our ability to connect uh in so many different channels now has it affected your work at all or how you approach anything well, yeah, yeah. I mean, the the internet has really, really changed. Uh, it's made some things easier. You can research quite easily now on the internet. If you if you trust what you find out there, you better go to several sources. So, for a writer, that's very, very helpful. But at the same time, we see the big uh, internet providers uh, really waging war against the publishers, the old uh, the old line New York publishers that uh, you know Harper Collins is publishing me, Random House did Rocket Boys, and so on. So I, I'm used to working with the old publishers. But I'm also, I recognize that uh, now self-publication is so easy, and there are a lot of been really very successful self-published works out there. Uh, Amazon came to me and asked me to write um, what what they call Kindle singles, which is the short form, like short stories. And I said, well, sure, I'll do that. Um, and uh, so I've got a couple of uh, short pieces out there um, 
uh, uh, with Amazon with Kindle Single. So you don't you don't cross those guys. You know, you, you, so I'm kind of straddling right now as a um, quote unquote big time author. You you can't. You can't just go one or the other. You've got to kind of straddle the line between the old line New York publishers and also these new guys on the block, which uh, who are so powerful. So it's interesting in trying to tell new writers, you know, what should they do? Should they go uh, the old route and try to find an agent and an editor up in New York and go to the old publishing houses or just go out there in the brave new world of the Internet and, and self-publish? I don't know. It kind of depends on the writer. kind of depends on the work. And um So there's no really good answer right now, so it's an interesting time to see how technology is actually changing um, those of us who write for a living. You mentioned this earlier. You had some experience, obviously, with October Sky uh, being the movie version of Rocket Boys. What what did that do to you as an author? Does that make you more excited to see uh, another one of your works come alive on the screen, or does it make you more apprehensive? Well, a little bit of both. Uh, it's uh, I often say the odds of getting your book made into a movie are about the same as being struck by lightning and eaten by a shark at the same time, and the results are very, very similar. Um, <laughs> basically, your the work gets taken out of your hands. It's handed over to a committee. Sometimes they're they're creative people. Sometimes they're not, and uh, so you really don't know what's going to come out of that meat grinder on the other end. I just got another book of mine called Torpedo Junction, the first book I ever wrote. Uh, you know, uh, uh, it's going to be a major motion picture and yeah. be involved with writing that. Uh, but um, I'd love for Carrying Albert Home to, to be a movie because there's just no better advertising. You know, it doesn't matter sometimes if it's a good or a bad movie. It doesn't really matter. Uh, all of a sudden, people look at that and they go, oh, my gosh, Hollywood likes it. it. must be really good. And they'll rush out and buy your book. So for an author, yeah, you really want Hollywood to come along and do something with it. Do you, uh, as you begin to work on all of these different things, do you have multiple projects going at once, or you try to focus on one project at a time? Yeah, I mean, it is, it's crazy. I mean, once you get out there in the publishing world about all the things that come in, people want you to... to uh, to, to write a little something for their blogs, and, you know, you want to be, uh, you know, I don't think I'm, I'm a West Virginia boy. I, I don't like to disappoint people, so I do what I, I possibly can for them, and publishers are always coming in. They want blurbs on their books, on other books, and uh, uh, we have a, a, a newsletter that we put out on uh, uh, homerhickam.com. You can go there and look at that, and and so there's always other writing going on, and then you're in the back of your mind, you, it's like, what's next, what's next, what are you going to do? And uh, because uh, I, you know, I'm I'm I, I, I'm a little bit older here, and uh, I I still got a lot of uh, books that I want to write. And I don't have much time, so um, I got to get with it. So it's a busy busy time still in my life, but it's it, you know it's my passion. I love to write. Fiction probably gives you a little bit more freedom on certain things, but do you have a preference, fiction versus nonfiction? I really don't. I, I like them both. And, uh, of course, the memoirs are kind of, they, they, they are in, in between. Uh, when you write a memoir, like Rocket Boys is really a story of growing up in the coal fields that use the techniques of a novel. Um, and uh, that's the, di- the memoir is a lot different from an autobiography in, in that regard. So we're carrying Albert home. Then we, what we see is a blend of a whole bunch of genres. We see a blend of, um, of memoir. We see, we see liter- uh, 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 lit- literary fiction. We also um, see a little bit of fantasy uh, a genre in there. So uh, writing it, I, I, I'm just like uh, I, I'm blending in a whole bunch of different uh, genres, but ultimately you have to call it something. And so uh, we called it fiction. Again, that's in the well-lit part of the uh, the bookstore, so I kind of like that. And um, we'll see um, if maybe I'm starting a whole new genre here, the the family legend genre. Well, that makes sense to me. Listen, we're very mindful that uh, you have a very busy schedule. We do appreciate you spending time with us today. The work is called Caring Albert Home, a novel, uh, of course, by one of America's favorite authors, Homer Hickman, who has not two, but numerous, numerous, <laughs> numerous works, including <laughs> Torpedo you, Junction, soon to be a major motion picture. Do we know who it's going to star yet? Not yet. Um, that'll be cool to, fi- to figure out uh, about that. It is about uh, a young man who's a Coast Guard captain, so uh, so we'll see. Well, listen, uh, best of luck with this, and uh, very anxious to see what the, the new work will be like as well, although you may be on a movie set for several months, I would assume. <laughs> 
Well, I can, I can put up with that if I have to. Uh, we'll see who the uh, the lead um, uh, female actor is, and I'll hang out with her like I did uh, Laura Dern when we did uh, October Sky. Yeah, that makes sense. Boy, <laughs> I bet the West Virginia boy in you was enjoying that piece for sure. <laughs> You're well, right. listen, again, have a, have a have a great uh, rest of the year, great 2016, and would love to talk to you again. Thank you, Warner. You bet. We'll be back with more right after this on Lewis at Large. 